So uh, I do a lot of these talks and they, they span across uh, marketing and other things, but I'll, I'll tell you this. I have been in the health and wellness and holistic space for 25 years. I've, I've worked with some of the largest brands. Um, I've developed the largest personal brands and, and media brands and developed well over a billion dollars in sales revenue alone. So oftentimes um, people come to me to wonder, how do I market my product, my holistic product as a coach, uh, as um, a personal brand or you know, as, a, as a course or um, a consumer packaged good product that they have? And that's what we'll talk about today. And at the Institute of Integrative Nutrition, um, it is a health coach training program. So specifically, we um, have an online course that lasts a year that certifies someone as a health coach. So that is my latest career um, and one that I am most passionate about because I think one online learning and personal development is the wave of the future and only getting better. Um, with that said, I've also written books, started wellness centers, um, launched C CPG, uh, CBD products. And so any question you have, likely I will be able to provide some insight, uh, insight from my own experience. And so when we start talking about marketing for holistic programs, there's a couple things that I want to talk about to set the stage. And then we will get into what everybody really wants to know is tactics. But strategy in particular, the first thing is marketing. Why do we call it marketing when really it's just sales? Right? It's because oftentimes we're uncomfortable with the word, word sales. We don't want to be salesmen. We want to be marketers, especially in the holistic space when oftentimes we're giving a product or a service that we feel as though um, is to the greater good, is, is of service and is helping someone. And we maybe... Uh, oftentimes, I run across coaches or other folks that feel awkward about charging for it. Um, oftentimes, you have entrepreneurs that are starting technology products or uh, a packaged good that they're sending out uh, or or marketing that don't feel badly about charging for it. But a lot of times, I find holistic marketers don't like to use the word sales uh, because they are feeling as though charging for a service that is to make you well. Um, is not the right thing to do, especially with coaches and other solo entrepreneurs. And I just wanted to spell that first and recommend a book. The Law of Divine Compensation by Marianne Williamson is something that we should all read as um, entrepreneurs and holistic wellness marketers and salespeople. The second part is marketing is sales. Basically, we're positioning a product for sale in a way that people are interested in. Um, so let's get really comfortable when we talk about marketing, knowing that we're doing marketing because we're actually selling an audience. And that's OK. If Coca-Cola can make billions of dollars a year selling a product that is ruining people's health, then holistic marketers deserve to make a heck of a lot more delivering products and services that are increasing the health and happiness of the world. So feel good about that. But when a common mistake that people often make when they start um, marketing their holistic business is they don't speak enough about the niche that they're in. So just like in healthcare, doctors aren't doctors, they're endocrinologists, ear, nose, and throat, uh, you know, neurologists. We also have to start to get into our niche because just saying living better or feeling better or being happier um, or the general transformation or general wellness is no longer applicable as the holistic market matures. So we really have to define our niche far more than you think you need to. So even if you think your niche is diabetes or, um, or something else, think further. The narrower you get, um, the more you'll have an uptick in sales. And you may say, well, maybe I'm cutting my market too much. And I don't want to be that niche because I also do this and this and this. Um, you can always grow your niche. It's hard to shrink it. So I say start as targeted as possible and grow a raving fan base. And then you can start to grow if you need to. 
but there are enough people in the world now that are interested in wellness and holistics that um, oftentimes, even if your niche is extremely targeted, it can yield an incredible amount of revenue for your business. So our value props, you know, oftentimes I see value propositions for products that are all about the product. No one cares about the product. All they care about is how they're going to benefit from the product. So your value proposition, please always have it be about your customer uh, and you know your very specific niche customer. Um, so your value prop has to be, it's not about you or your product. And some people get confused by this because they're like, yes, I have to explain what my product does. And those are product benefits. But you have to explain it in a way that is about how your customer is going to act, feel, or live due to it, right? They're not buying your product, they're buying the solution. We've all heard that before. Um, but what is really important is the hook, right? No matter what kind of medium you're marketing on or selling on, you, know, you have to be different and have a solution. So if you go and read your marketing copy or your sales copy, and it's bland, it's, um, it's general, and, and it doesn't provide a solution or it talks more about you than the benefits that the person will get, um, then you certainly need to reevaluate that, okay? Um, be human. You know, we, we always saw this with, I always go back to Jerry Seinfeld. The reason why he was so popular, the show Seinfeld was so popular, is because he was just touching on everyday human things that people can relate to. When you're human, you're relatable and people want to buy more. Human marketing. And that goes to when you're being human, you can really tap into the emotional element. You, know, you can make an emotional connection, which is very important. When you make an emotional connection, your product goes through the roof in terms of sales. An emotional connection is what drives it. You can often do this through content and now through storytelling. So if you're looking at your product or your service or your personal brand, just to recap this, because sometimes we think it's basic and then we go and we look and we say, oh, yes. If I'm looking at my product or um, my brand or my personal brand and it does not stand out, because I haven't made an emotional connection, because I played it safe, because I use buzzwords, because I use general um, marketing statements of value propositions, because I didn't tell a story, then that's why you're not. There. If you aren't niche enough, meaning um, no one really knows why they need it or what it's for, um, because it's a general topic, or even if you think you're niche because you think it's hormone health for women, that's not niche enough anymore. So. Once you get to a very specific audience, you know what your audience wants, you speak to them about the benefit they're going to get, not about your product, and you do it in an emotional way that creates a story that they can relate to, and then you create content out of that, that's your marketing that will go through the roof every time. Emotional connection through storytelling, that's relatable to a very specific audience. Okay, so that's what I have to say there. I know now, how do you do that? Specifically, how do you do that? Should I use social media? Should I use print ads? Should I use ambassadors? How do I actually do that? Um, and then what should my product be? So if you're a solo entrepreneur, what I really love for products now, um, especially if you're a coach or someone else, um, is online learning. Courses are exploding. You'll see if you follow anyone, even Tony Robbins and, and Dean Graciela, they're all getting behind this you're not too late, right? There is this personal development boom like we've never seen before. And people are more comfortable um, purchasing these products online. So I love courses, but how do you get people to buy your course? You know, how do you get people to buy your product and do other things? It's really important to start to create a community. Uh, a community is, uh, and I'm gonna preface this because uh, there's another book uh, by Charles Vogel, Charles Vogel, about how to build a community. The community that you build around your product can drive extreme success. 
a community wants to be part of something specific, like I said, niche, and it wants to feel uh, involved and part of something. A community is supportive. A community is not a customer list. A community is not a group of people that gave your email address because they wanted a free guide, right? So how do you build community? Because once you build community, you can build a funnel, a marketing funnel that engages the community and then drives them to purchase a course or something else or your product, but also drives them to then get other people on your behalf to purchase that stuff. So once you figure out the emotional connection of your product, right, in terms of sales and marketing, you really want to see how you can build a community around it. And again, don't mistake your community for a group of people that gave an email address because they wanted something. Right now, we can talk about how to create a community because I think today the most beneficial ways to get the word out about your um, product in an authentic, relatable way is through recommendation. And sometimes you can, you know, sometimes you can cheat that system and go with influencers or brand ambassadors, right? But people kind of know that if an influencer that doesn't really talk about your product or isn't in your space starts talking about your product or service, um, it's not real. And it has far less of a conversion rate to sale. So yes, I like to use influencers and other ambassadors. I think it's really important, but I like to use them from my own community. Now, how do I build a community? That's the important part. Because when you have that community, you have those built-in ambassadors and influencers and ways to market. So building a community is all around engagement and building trust and giving a way for people to connect. I really like in-person events for this. Even if you're meetup, even if you start cre creating meetups, free meetups um, for your um, community that um, maybe you have a new tonic or a functional nutrition beverage, and you get 10 people to come to um, a coffee shop that, that you've given your product to, uh, and, and you get 10 people to come and enjoy the beverage there with them, right? And instead of talking about the beverage with those 10 people, you um, create questions for them that creates an emotional connection between them right? Prompts so that they can be drinking your beverage, but the prompts that they get to talk about with each other creates an emotional connection and a bond between each other. And they relate that to the time that they were drinking your beverage, right? You gave value to them and you built a community based on your brand. And even if it's only 10 people, those 10 people go out or will be far more apt to recommend your product when you ask them to. So giving free value in person, even if it's small, uh, targeted, guerrilla type style events um, that make an emotional connection between people in person, super important to building a community. Now, if you can get bigger events like uh, this conference that is being created here, uh, even better. But as long as you make an emotional connection, that's how you build a great community. Now you can do this online as well. You can do this very easily online as well. Um, you can create webinars, you can create Zoom forums. I, when I do a webinar, typically uh, I do it in a Zoom format where I can see everybody's face and I get the audience connecting with each other so that we can start to talk to each other, share insights, people can respond, tell how they're feeling. And that always creates an emotional connection. So every time you create an emotional connection, you create a community. And you can start to build the community strength around that. The community is often around your niche. And so I, you can start to think, do I, I, I can build this without a product, right? I can build a group of really strong people without a product, and then I can insert it in, or I can build it around the product. But it's really important. Um, so the community is super important. There is a place for customer lists. There is a place for creating a marketing funnel that attracts someone online through something uh, and then gets them to sign up 
and then you email them or text message them in terms of your marketing. A real place for that. There's also a funnel that drives them down to take a quiz that then leads them to the quiz answers that then leads them to um, take another action that allows them to uh, interact with your brand, service, or product. Uh, webinars are also a really great tool to use for that. So that's the second part. One is if you can't create a community and you just have a customer list and you want to market to them, use a marketing funnel that segments them and targets them and gives them uh, different prompts, to take an action. Um, and that's a great way to create a marketing funnel. And I like to do that um, via Facebook or Instagram or others. So if I was to say of most important, being in person and building small groups of people are the really targeted ways to build a community that gets really strong. And over time, those build. But also you need the mass avenue of, okay, I'm going to reach a large audience uh, over social media and drive them into my market. So important for both coaches and brands and others. So I'm going to take a stop there um, because that's a lot of information uh, and we have 10 minutes left. And um, Celeste, are there some questions that I did not hit on that maybe you want to uh, bring up? Yes, absolutely. So we have one that asked about tips for increasing social media followers. Okay, tips for increasing social media followers. Um, social media, Instagram and TikTok have gone towards video. So if you haven't experimented with reels yet, you really need to, right? And reels, okay. So if you make movement, so how do you create the best reel on Instagram, say? Um, one, trending music. You can go into Instagram. They have an arrow pointing up near any music that's trending, meaning like people really love listening to it on and typically get more views based on the reel. Uh, movement within the first three seconds, um, activity. Uh, so yes, Instagram and other social medias are trending towards a video, create more reels. It's pretty easy to do and you can get more specific. You know, the, the better produced the reel is, the more views and uh, engagement it gets. So, you know, get your iPhone out, get great lighting, you know, take clips, don't just talk straight through. You can very easily chop up clips on Instagram reels and use trending music, right? Use trending music. So leverage the reel, that's the hottest thing now to get more views and followers. Um, but also consistency of posting. Um, you have to post regularly. If you just kind of jump in there and post, you don't build an audience, you have to be consistent. Just like with your relationships and building your community, consistency is key. What's another one, Celeste? Awesome. Okay. So you kind of answered two in one there with the video marketing question as well. So I am going to go to, there was one funny question here that was just actually three words. It was, is Twitter dead? So before we move on from social, let's answer that real quick. It depends if you have a large audience that's active and engaged or not. So, um, Twitter is not a place that I actively engage with marketing because it was more top of the funnel for me and it wasn't driving any sales. Uh, I couldn't build a community. And with the Institute for Integrative Nutrition now, we have millions of people in our community and it's a real community. We have regular events, et cetera. So Twitter has not been something that I've used. If you have a large audience on Twitter and you find that you can engage them through your information, um, then great. It's not dead for you. There is engagement. You have an audience. If I was to start new from zero, I would not start with Twitter. Understood. Yeah, I totally agree with that one. Um, okay. The holistic space, is it growing as a whole? It seems to be that the plant-based portion of it is growing the fastest. Is that true? You know, I feel like, um, is the holistic space growing as a whole? The answer is yes. When you look at um, holistic and wellness spending in general, I think it, the latest statistics is a $4 trillion marketplace. Uh, and in plant-based in, in general, 
um, is it feels like it's been growing for quite a while, hasn't it? Uh, so that's always been a popular segment, right? But again, plant-based what? And is it you know plant-based diets, plant-based foods, plant-based products? You know, they're coaching for plant-based. Find out what you want in your niche because the more specific you get, um, the more you don't have to worry about whether it's growing or not. There'll always be people there that need you. Um, however, I think what's really growing quickly um, is functional nutrition, functional uh, medicine and, and functional uh, kind of the way of living. How, how am I really uh, looking into uh, the foods and the nutrition that I eat, which also lends to a little bit of, of biohacking, um, which is more in the wellness space, but you know, people are really looking to how do I um, biohack in the sense that so I can live longer, feel better, um, and keep my cognitive sense. So a couple of trends that I see in holistic wellness, well, health coaching, um, specifically around um, nutrition that's off your plate, meaning um, you counseling around relationships, um, spirituality, meditation, uh, the metaphysical, uh, and, and career are holistic health topics that are really growing. And then there's the nutrition that's on your plate, which is functional nutrition uh, and integrated nutrition. So um, food has always been, especially plant-based, something growing. But I think that if you're looking to see what the trend is, um, look at functional nutrition and look at um, the uh, mind-body connection. You can see that there are a lot of uh, holistic uh, products coming and solutions coming for mental health and for greater connection to spirituality. And, you know, you can see that with, you know, giants like Headspace coming in, but there are, are a number of other um, technologies and tools that, that are starting to grow in that space as well. Awesome. That is so true. And that's some great information. The, it seems like the portion that's growing as well with that very strongly is like you said, the apps space. But again, that brings us back to your point of online learning and personal development. Yes. I mean, online learning and coursework and creating a course, you, know, you don't think of that as holistic health, but it is 100%. That is you know, if, if you can create a specific course for an audience that, you know, is really, for example, um, medical Qigong is uh, difficult to find a practitioner, especially within Chinese medicine, you can't Google it. You don't, it's hard to find someone in your area. Um, so, in, and, or fascial, um, fascial health, meaning moving the fascia in your body, uh, dramatically includes your health, can even change the way that you look. Um, not easy to go and find a practitioner out there. However, now there are some courses and some apps that you can actually go and take um, that can uh, really dramatically improve your health. Things like um, Qigong Academy and Human Garage um, are places that you can go. And these are businesses that are sprouting up that are doing an amazing job um, providing information, tools, and services through education and coursework um, for people and also supplements. Um, but they've built a community. You may not have heard of them until you actually want to be in that community. And the, then you see it's a really small, uh, really strong community in, in a rapidly growing trend monetized by supplements and coursework. Right, absolutely. Okay, so let's fit in one more question here. And I want to leave time for you to tell everybody how to contact you. Um, probably, let's see, I can squeeze some of these. Um, how do I market myself as a coaching consultant? Which you could probably answer that one in your sleep. So tell me the, tell me that one real quick because we actually did get that one several times. Great. Um, coaches. Hi, coaches. You guys are my favorite. I train 150,000 coaches, 15,000 a year, and I work very specifically with coaches. So if you are, um, first thing I would say, if you're um, looking to how to market yourself as a coaching consultant, consider never using that word again, coaching consultant. 
um, and find what you're actually coaching people on. Like, what are you consulting them on? So you need to really define what kind of coach you are very specifically um, so that people know exactly how to go, go and find you. That is super important. The next thing you need to do is very easy grassroots. Start telling everybody that you know that you are that coach. And, uh, and then start to think really about what you deliver as a service. Meaning if you are um, a um, microbiome expert, meaning you or you're a health coach with um, a microbiome expertise for gut health supplementation, that means that you know how to optimize a human's gut health using supplementation in food. Um, so that they what? So that they have more energy, they have less depression, they have better digestion, they can sleep better. So the way I start to market myself is to create content, uh, video reels on Instagram, TikToks, and start to tell people and talk to people about how you've helped people feel better. Meaning tell a story about the woman that you met that couldn't sleep and was unhappy and very bloated and not not feeling great and how you were able to um, get her to a place that she slept comfortably, her depression lifted, and she felt more vital and energized all by working with you and do it without ever mentioning what you do. And someone will say, how did you do that? You know, so tell a story, be very specific about your niche coaches and create the content that shows the results as opposed to saying what you do and who you are and why you do it. So that's, that, that's about you. It's never about you. Remember that coaches, it's always about them. Um, it's always about them. And then optimize all of your LinkedIn, social media profiles, et cetera, um, to be reflective of that. And the last thing is every time you talk to someone, mention what you're doing. You know, oftentimes we um, we feel like this is self, you know, self promotion or um, uncomfortable for us to do. But the only way that you get the word out is really by communicating it and giving it to the universe, giving it giving it up to the world that that this is what you're here for, and and that's how clients come. Amazing. Amazing. Okay. So Jim, we have come to the end of our time. Thank you so very much for being with us. It, I was just thrilled to even find out that we could get you for half an hour. So that was amazing. Um, tell everyone where they can reach you, where they can find you. Uh, you can find me on Instagram, Jim Curtis one. If you're interested in the Institute for Integrative Nutrition, you can find us at nutrition school on Instagram. So I'm at Jim Curtis one. Institute for Integrative Nutrition or integratednutrition.com or just very easily um, at, at Nutrition School on Instagram. I've also written a book called The Stimulati Experience if anybody's interested in reading that. And that is... That is afternoon, wherever you are. I'm so happy to be here. And um, yes, I want to actually share with you a slideshow that I made for today, because I think giving a visual will really help kind of hone in on not only what I do, but how we can bring more healing into our spaces and health. Uh, today, I'm going to be speaking about creating a wellness environment through design. And what I see is one of the biggest issues of our time as far as like through a wellness space is how buildings affect us emotionally and how most of the buildings over the last century have really been failing us emotionally. So the problem that I see is we spend 90% of our time indoors and we have to realize the impact that our architecture and design has on our well-being and how every element of a space affects our health. The place or space around you can make you happy or stress, and this is the emotional body that we were talking, that Jim was talking about, and so it can affect our health. 
So you could take people from a place of anxiety and stress or fear to a place of actually hope and happiness through how you design a space or an environment. And you can just look at the spaces that Disney actually created and the different worlds that within Disney World. And I was actually just there a couple of days ago for a conference. Um, so this is exactly what Disney was trying to create. They created it in order to have a specific effect on people who visited Disney World. And this effect was to bring them to a place of hope and happiness. So you can create a wellness environment that does this, that actually promotes healing. And that is what I'm gonna be talking about today. So who am I? My name is Tamar Gale, and as um, was mentioned, I'm an architectural and interior designer. I also do um, independent developing, and I've co-started a movement for creating generational impact through innovative, sustainable, and ethical architecture and design, and as a solution to well-being, longevity, and social impact. So you could say that a little bit of my history is you could say that I'm an eclectic mystic, meets world traveler. And I feel that my personality and perspective of the world has actually broadened, been broadened by my travels and my experiences of all the different cultures that I've, that I've um, had the pleasure of being around. So and I grew up outside of a small town in the Midwest and um, I was surrounded by around 75 acres of forest. And my favorite thing to do was to get lost in nature. And in my early 20s, I started traveling the world and I and I've actually never stopped. And I've lived in places such as New Zealand, Miami, Hawaii, the French Alps, and short stays in different other countries. And I spent time studying under shamans from Australia and New Zealand, and I'm sorry, and Mexico, not New Zealand, it was Australia and Mexico. And I have to say that having experienced everything that I've experienced has shifted something within me. And I learned to live and breathe the earth and noticing the slightest forms of life. And I actually have been able to see the effects of how we live, the effects on our, on our bodies and our mentalities and how we, we live in this world. So I have worked in the healing and holistic field for 21 years. I've also been working as a designer for 14. And I've led workshops and retreats in places like London, Paris, Miami, Costa Rica, the French Alps. And now I combine all of my knowledge together to create environments that are designed to heal the body, mind, and soul, connecting people back with nature and back to themselves. And this is why I'm here today to speak about creating a wellness environment through design. So maybe you've tried this before, but I actually wanna take you through um, a little exercise. So go ahead and close your eyes and think of a place that makes you feel calm. Envision it, really feel it, smell it. And when you have this place in mind and a good sense of this place, go ahead and open your eyes. And if you can type in the chat, how many of you actually envisioned a place in nature? Give me a thumbs up. So people have always dreamed of a happy healing place and this place is called paradise. So if you Google up the word paradise, what you see comes up is actually places of nature. And this is because people know that nature actually improves our mood. There's a part of the brain that recognizes beautiful views, universal, universal places, preferred scenes, beautiful views of nature. And it turns out that this part of our brain is actually rich in endorphins. And maybe this is the reason that we will pay more for a room with a view when we go on vacation, because we actually are giving our shot, ourselves a shot of endorphins. So if you will go and pay for a room with a view, type that in the chat, give me a one. 
So what I believe is it brings us back to our bodies. This being in nature actually brings us back into our bodies. It reconnects us to our inner self and connects us to our right brain. And I'm going to explain why in a minute. And to the universal spirit, um, what we could call source creation. And I just want to explain this very quickly as it has something to do with how we experience connection, life and spirit, which is what we are looking to create when we are designing a wellness environment. So, oops. So this slide here, it shows the right and the left brain and the right brain sees everything holistically. You can see the greenery in the photo and the left brain focuses on details. And when you are focused in the right brain, like an animal is, then you are a part of the unity of creation. You actually feel that you are a part of the unity of creation. So and we are in a time right now when our evolution as humans, um, where most of our right brain is starting to come back online. And this, I believe, relates deeper to design. And the way it relates to design on a deeper level is um, extremely fascinating. I'm not really sure I have time to cover that today, but um, it does relate to design. And at this stage in our human evolution, what helps us to connect is through our senses and the stimulation of those senses. What you touch, what you see, what you feel, what you hear, especially as it relates to nature, is what we need most in design and especially in designing a wellness environment. As humans possess a deep biologically rooted tendency to seek connections with nature and other forms of life. We find it healing and it actually is healing. And so how do we do this? How do we create wellness environments that not only heal the people who enter the space, but also reconnects them back to the universal source of creation? And when I say reconnect, I just want to be clear that we're always connected. We forget how to connect. And every element of space affects our health. What you see, what you smell, what you hear, what you feel, the senses that I'm speaking of, they all have an effect on how we feel within a space. And their connection to our surroundings through our senses that tell an unfolding story. This unfolding story is actually what I think Disney was trying to create, what he understood as it creates an emotional positive response. And I found this incredible scientific study done on sensorial deprivation that I want to kind of go over real quickly because I think it will bring something to light. Um, this study was done on sensorial, sensorial deprivation and it was carried out by the CIA on students. And they took a white room with white walls and floors, air conditioned it perfectly, added the perfect light levels inside the room. And then they put the students in there with white gloves on in a room kind of like this. And what they discovered was that after 24 hours, the students started to show signs of hallucination. And after 48 hours, they actually started to break down and collapse. And so what does this show? For me, it shows that sens sensory deprivation is actually bad for us. It's very unhealthy for us and it's bad for our brain. And what we could see as something like atrophy for the muscles is actually kind of what I can see happening to the brain when we have this deprivation of um, stimulation of sensory or sensory stimulation. So in order to fight back, our brain actually begins to hallucinate. More than 50% of the world now live in cities. Who here lives in a city? If you do, type of five. And how, and many people spend 87% of their time indoors and since the 30s, these indoor spaces have become more and more artificial, like the white room that I showed you initially, with artificial lights, air conditioning, stacked buildings, nicely sealed up, uh, which doesn't really allow anything to come in or out, very different from the ancient architecture, where you're not able to breathe fresh air and you're actually breathing air that is circulated through the building and that everyone else has been breathing all day. And I find that kind of, um, not a pleasant thought. 
So moving on further, there is a science called aliesthesia, where scientists have found that what you want is actually a stimulation of the senses. And you want that stimulation to change and to vary throughout the day. Even if you have the perfect stimulation, you still want that stimulation to vary. So what this shows is that the same stimulation all day is actually unhealthy, in my opinion. <laughs> So just take a look at nature. It is never the same. It changes. The light changes. The air changes. We have sunrises and sunsets. And type of one, if you love to watch the sunrise or sunset. An amazing thing about that is that the light in the evening, it helps your body produce melatonin in a very natural way. And this is the way that our bodies were made. This is the way we're made to, to live. But being on our computers and on our phones and in the offices and using blue light all the time actually has that opposite effect on us. And we find that a lot of people are having difficulty sleeping. And I know we have someone here that's speaking about sleep. So let's get to the solution. There's a style of design called biophilia. Biophilia is a hypothesis that suggests that humans possess a deep biologically rooted tendency to seek connections with nature and other forms of life. And this is popularized by E.O. Wilson and the term biophilia actually means the love of life or living systems. So if we can think back to the exercise that I did with you earlier in nature, we can kind of get a feel for this and what that stimulation creates within our bodies. And when you walk into a forest and you connect with nature and you actually connect and feel the breeze, you feel and see the light as it changes around you, you hear the nature. This is the stimulation of the senses that I'm talking about. It actually does light up your brain and releases the endorphins that we need. And when we think of places that make us feel the best, we tend to think of nature. Nature has this incredible ability to make us feel better, but our cities don't really allow for that. So it's important for us to create these spaces, these environments, to create environments where we don't just survive, but we actually thrive and flourish. Environments that have the ability to improve heart rates and blood pressure levels, that make us feel happy and that make us feel good. So if there's anyone here that would like more of that in your life, give me a thumbs up. And I wanna get into how we can do this then. We can mimic and invoke a feeling of nature even through indirect connection, which can alleviate stress with lots of natural light in the photo, a water feature, fresh air, materials that reflect the changing seasons, the variation of light and pattern and space and texture, which fills us with the sense of peace and tranquility when we are immersed in nature, we can actually bring this into our designs. The use of plants can create an immediate connection with nature. They immediately add life. And we can add plants into a space by creating a focal point to partition off spaces, to add layers and textures and contrast, highlighting distinctive features. We can add it in artwork. And there's so much more that we can do with plants in the space. We can invoke the feeling of nature through natural materials, colors, patterns, textures, and shapes, which can look like nature or have a feel of nature with natural woods, fabrics, ceramics, bringing in biophilic and fractal qualities, as well as inherent warmness through the textures and the colors. Exaggerated and oversized details, which kind of bring in the welcoming feeling and a feeling of being hugged. And we're seeing that shapes through this are becoming sculptural and curvilinear and curvilinear brings in a feeling of softness instead of the hard edges. 
and we see a merging of the indoor and outdoor spaces. And in, in this merging actually is perfect for creating a wellness environment um, in any space. And I have to touch on labyrinths. Labyrinths, has anyone ever walked a labyrinth? If you have, let me know in the chat. And labyrinths are actually great for healing centers, healing spaces, because they help with brain injury and PTSD. And I want to be sure to add in intention. And this is something I'm really passionate about because it, within a wellness environment, because whatever your spiritual practice is, whether you're clearing with sage, meditating, burning incense, or using prayer, um, continuing a spiritual practice within a space brings in a, re a resonance of the creative source, this divine energy. And this in itself is what brings in um, a higher harmonic of peacefulness, um, harmony, healing energy into any wellness environment. And that's at home or anywhere else. We can bring that, that energy in. And if you've ever walked into a temple or a space that, um, like the monks here, and felt that peaceful resonance of energy, then that is what I'm talking about. Designing the space as a sanctuary, creating spaces that naturally support us where we can sit, relax, recuperate through supportive layouts, the use of mindful objects as meaningful accessories, and the focus on toxin-free natural materials and fragrances. The choice of surface materials can facilitate improvements in our well-being by choosing natural materials. Things that are artificially made or even ones that we feel are natural uh, that have been processed or coated with chemicals actually has shown to prove to have a negative effect on our energy to actually disturb our energy. But thankfully we are seeing there's more and more options um, becoming available for clean, for clean um, materials. And many of us have been fueled by a desire to consume less but better, to live and design more consciously. And we see a direction moving towards elevated minimalism, which can be created within a wellness environment and which contains warmth to it. And this is employed through the use of honest natural materials, a sense of reassuring simplicity and a warm natural color palette, as I mentioned before. And as humans, humans, we possess a deep biologically rooted tendency, as I mentioned, to connect, to want to connect with nature. And I believe that our solution to create a wellness environment through design is by embracing nature itself and bringing in its forms into a wellness environment through the elements that interact and stimulate our senses done so through the textures that we feel, the sounds we hear, the play of light and pattern, along with natural materials and the fluid softness of shapes. All of these elements can create the story in which we experience our environment and in turn experience ourselves, each other, and our connection to source. So how many of you through this session put, were put into a calmer state of mind and just feel into that? And um, I'm going to open up for questions. Awesome. Thank you so much. I know I was here zenning out completely. Oh, that was great, Tamar. Thank you. Um, so yes, we have three questions. The yeah. first one, and you kind of hit it now at the very end, but... Um, it is, sorry about that. It is, is minimalism best as I have been hearing a lot about that? Is it best and according to what, in contrast to? I don't know. That's all the question says. I probably, is it a good thing? You know, is it? Minimalism is wonderful. And that, um, I'm not saying that, you know, other styles or not, we just see, we see a direction heading in that, in that way. And the thing about me, and I can't get too much into this today because I know we don't have a lot of time, but um, a lot of, a lot of clutter or a lot of um, 
uh, like stuff around can actually have an effect on how we focus and how we how um, constructive we are. So there is a correlation between those two. And also I think minim minimalism also is coming into play because there's a lot of us that are living more intentionally and we want things that are good and of quality and coming from um, places that actually support um, communities or artists, artisans. And we're actually being more conscious of the things and, that we're buying and that we're filling our home with. And I think that's a really beautiful thing about minimalism. And I hope that answers the question. <laughs> Absolutely. Okay. Um, next one is if you are limited to an apartment or small space, what would your recommendations be? Hmm. How do you want to feel in that space? Um, really bringing in textures that feel good to you, colors that feel good to you. Um, things that are, yeah, using those senses to actually create the space and feeling into how you want to utilize the space that you're living in. Like I have an area that invites people to sit on the floor, you know, so a fur rug and, you know, natural materials and things that actually feel good to touch. And um, I think that as long as you're going with what feels good to you and your senses and, and how you want to feel within that space or how you want to invite people into that space and you actually think about those as you're designing, then you're going to have a space that, that fits you perfectly. Awesome. Okay. So another one just came in. Could alternative architecture be a better solution to a wellness environment? 100%. Um, so I have actually co-partnered and that's what I was speaking about earlier um, with D DFH group. And we are developing um, innovative ethical architecture and design. And the reason for that is, because with innovation, what we're seeing today is it's actually um, uh, ecologically um, with, what am I trying to say with, um, I just lost the word, but with like utilities, right? We're gonna see that innovative designs actually um, help us save money, but not only that, like the, what we built, what we actually build is disaster resistant. So any hurricanes, up to 400 mile per hour winds, um, flooding, tornadoes, anything like that. And we actually go into disaster places that have um, been affected by disaster. And so I think by using these innovative designs, we actually are doing very well for the, not only the environment, but for the people that live within them. And, um, saving lives at the same time. Very true. Okay. So another one just came in. How can I integrate these concepts with other design for wellness concepts, such as ergonomics, inclusivity, accessibility, and sustainability and resilience? Hmm. Um, the sustainability is there. So sustainability has to do with materials, with um, a lot that biophilia is actually talking about. So it's not really it's, it's not really going against anything else, the ergonomics or um, sustainability. It actually helps to promote it. And you can easily add them in with, like I mentioned, plants, the materials, um, uh, the, the features that you have, such as water, natural light, all of those things are, are just a complement to any other design. Awesome. Okay. I am going to um, cut it off now. We are at the end of your time tomorrow, but it has been absolutely amazing. I've been glued to my screen. Thank you so much. And can you tell everyone where they can, uh, can contact you at for additional questions? Yes. So feel free to email me. Um, it's Tamar at the Akasha interiors.com. And definitely you, you will find that email at my, on my website and that's the Akasha interiors.com T H E A K A S H A interiors with an S.com. Awesome. Thank you so, so very much. Have a great day.
for having me. Well, I'm excited to be here. And of course, I'm giving a shameless plug to my book. The information I'm going to cover here is going to just be over three chapters because we only had 30 minutes. So let's get in and start talking about who I am to give you some background information, and then we'll dive into the presentation. So as uh, was stated, I have a PhD from University of Houston in exercise physiology. I then did a postdoc in HIV AIDS immunology at the UT Health Center in Houston. I've been a professor for a little over 10 years. And then in January, I made the switch to publishing uh, as now the senior editor for the journal Advanced Biology. I am an author of two books. The first one is Exercise Ain't Enough, Hit Honey and the Hadza. It talks about hit training and nutrition effectively. And that book can also be found on Amazon. So I'm gonna hop in here and talk about my family real quick because I think it's important for everybody to understand our background. I have a wife and daughter. This is they, we live in Dallas. Uh, we are a fit family to say the least. The second picture here on the right is when we ran the Houston half marathon when my daughter Kaya was eight and she was the youngest female entrant in that race. This was right before COVID hit. My wife comes from more of a running background and just like you, she has MS. And that's another thing I'll be talking about in terms of some of the research that I did about swimming when we were writing this book. My daughter is very active in aquatics. So this is her playing water polo and she also swims for Dallas Mustangs and she runs cross country. Uh, she's done a number of sports. She's currently playing soccer. So this stuff that I'm going over, it's not just from the PhD that I've got. It's from years and years of experience of being an athlete myself and now also coaching and training my daughter and my wife. So my fitness background, I come from a swimming background. I swam on a scholarship at the University of Puget Sound in the mid nineties. We won the national championships in 95 and 96. Uh, after swimming for a number of years, I switched over to doing triathlon at a pretty high level. Moved on from that to ultra marathon. And then I started getting really slow. So I thought, you know, as slow as I am, I'm gonna shift over and start lifting some more weights. And I put on quite a bit more mass and started doing Olympic weightlifting and what are called Highland Games. So if you're not familiar with these, it's a bunch of uh, pituitary cases that are throwing around stones and logs and having a great time with it. And recently I've come around and gone full circle doing triathlon again, but not really interested in the actual competition, more of the experience. So I work with a group called Ainsley's Angels and we pair up with a, a physically disabled athlete and we act as their angel. And so in this case, this is my teammate, Mei Ling, and I towed her in a rubber dinghy for 300 yards and then put her in this same contraption attached to my bike for 12 miles. And then we ran for two miles. So those are the kinds of things that I'm doing currently. And now we're going to hop in and talk about the premise for this presentation. So the overview is that we're going to start by talking about three special properties of water that make exercise and just existence in water very different than what you would experience if you exercise or just walk on land in air. Uh, We'll talk about the horizontal position of swimming versus being the vertical position of terrestrial exercise. And then we'll get into the nitty gritty of the book, which is how swimming is better than land-based exercise for a number of different health parameters. We'll specifically cover cardiovascular health, respiratory health, and then mental health. And then there should be plenty of time left over for questions and answers. So without further ado, let's get this party started. All right, so water is an alien environment for humans. We're not supposed to be in water in terms of existence. Certainly, we can't breathe underwater. And so we notice that there's some very different, the big differences in terms of how our body responds to being in water than how it responds to being on land. So we're going to start off with the first one, which is buoyancy. Now, we're all familiar with buoyancy. If we look at this dotted line, this is where the water level was before the duck got dunked into it, OK? Gravity is pushing the duck down so that a portion of the duck is under the water. Now, the volume of the duck that's under the water is equivalent to the volume of water that's displaced. That volume allows for a vertical pressure from the water on the duck, pushing it back up. Now, why this is important when we think of humans getting into water is unloading the body, taking the effects of gravity off of our joints and our muscles. So if we look at the slants going into, let's say a pool, and we have this person walking in about groin depth into water, they're about 40% unloaded in terms of their total body weight. If they go into about their navel, now they're about half of their body weight is unloaded. They go into their sternum, we're at about 60%. And if you're brave enough to go all the way in 
neck deep. Now we've unloaded everything except for just the head. So the impact of this should be quite clear, but let's actually contrast this what we would see if we had running or cycling, which are the two most common aerobic endurance exercises that we see on land. With running, we have these big impact forces with the feet hitting the ground with every single stride that we take, up to five to seven Gs of force. So if you consider when we're standing still, that's one G. So we're increasing the amount of weight that we're carrying on our joints by five to seven times when we take a step like this. So what impact does this have? Well, it puts a lot of strain on the ankles, on the knees, the hips, and the, sp the spine as well. We can move over to cycling, which would be considered a low impact exercise. Now we're, no we're removing those hammering forces of ground impact forces, but we still have a lot of shear forces on the knees. Okay, the, the hips and the lower back are held in this position for extended periods of time, which makes it very difficult for those core muscles to hold that position if they're not very well trained. Now we contrast both of these with swimming. Okay, swimming is effectively a no impact activity. Okay, we're not really making any contact with solid surfaces aside from the start, the turn and the finish. And those are real short and they're actually minimal in terms of the actual forces that are generated relative to the other sports. Okay, so we're taking a great deal of strain off of the body. Okay, moving on to the next thing we're gonna talk about which hydrostatic pressure. Now this basically just means water pressure on the body. So if you've ever jumped into a pool and you've submerged yourself maybe six or seven feet down, maybe in the deep end where the big diving boards are, you can start to feel some pain on your ears. Okay, well, that's hydrostatic pressure. The column of water that's above you is actually pushing down on you, on your eardrums. Okay, as we get deeper into water, we experience more of that hydrostatic pressure squeezing on the body. So much so that if we get into water that's about four feet deep, which is not that very deep really, we experience about 89 millimeters of mercury of force. Now, I want you to remember this number for just a few seconds as I move on to the next slide to describe why this would be important. For most individuals who are quite healthy and have a good circulatory system, this is not gonna be that impactful. But for those who have a weaker circulatory system and suffer from what's called peripheral edema, which is effectively swelling of the lower extremities, swimming is gonna be quite important. So in this case, we have an individual who's got a lot of additional fluid that has been built up in their tissues, okay? What, what we want to see is that as blood travels down, it gets squeezed out into the tissues, which we want, because it's gonna carry nutrients, it's gonna carry water, but then we wanna see that the venous system can actually bring that back to the circulatory system. Now, there's a number of reasons why people would suffer from peripheral edema. I have some to some degree. Some of mine is from years and years of weightlifting. I've actually made the valves in my veins weaker so that I get some reflux going back down and I get a pulling of blood in my legs. Now, what we want for anybody with peripheral edema to do is exercise. But what can be problematic in land-based exercises is that when we exercise, blood pressure actually increases, which squeezes even more fluid out into these peripheral tissues, okay? So that we can start off with a foot before exercise that looks like this, and then a foot after exercise that looks like this. Now, the common treatment for this is to wear compression garments, and these are great. I wear these all the time, but the tightest compression garments you're going to get, they'll give you about 40 to 50 millimeters of mercury of pressure, squeezing those fluids back into circulation and back up to the heart. If you go into water that's four feet deep and do some water aerobics or water jogging, you're getting 89 millimeters of mercury pressure. So almost double what you would get from compression garments. So it offers a great deal of relief from individuals who suffer from peripheral edema. So what we see here is even in an individual who's quite healthy, as they stand still, they'll get a pulling of blood in their calves and their lower extremities. We take the same person and we stand them in water. The hydrostatic pressure squeezes that fluid back into circulation and forces that fluid back up to the heart, okay? And from that, we can actually allow for this individual to work out harder, longer, because they will actually have a more efficient heart working at that moment. The third property of water that's different than air is heat transfer. All right, so we have a boiled egg that's sitting here on your counter in air, and then we take another boiled egg and we stick it into water that's the same temperature as the air. Which of these is gonna cool faster? obviously the egg that's in the water, because water can actually absorb a great deal more heat than can air. Now, why is this important? For two reasons. For unhealthy people, so we really have three populations. We have the um, frail elderly, 
we have overweight, obese, and then we have individuals with neurological diseases like MS. All of these individuals have difficulty with heat stress, okay? It's, it, they're heat intolerant in many instances. Now we want all of these populations to exercise, but if you live in a place like Dallas or anywhere in Texas or the lower half of the, the, the continental United States, it's hotter than Hades nine months out of the year and it makes it very difficult to actually do long-term exercise at high intensities on land. That's where water comes in. With swimming, you can dissipate that heat very rapidly and it keeps these individuals away from heat stress and they can work out harder, longer, which is really what we want from any exercise activity. For healthy individuals, actually this is for everybody, but for healthy individuals, this is really what you're gonna be interested in. When we hop into a pool that's like 76 to 77 degrees competition temperature and you just sit there, in short order, you're gonna be feeling cold enough that you have to shiver. So you actually have to generate additional heat above what's gonna be produced during your workout to keep your body from getting cold. Now, the great thing about this is that when you hop out of the water, you maintain that additional heat dissipation into air for hours after the workout. You do the same thing if you work out on land, but you'll do it longer and you'll do it well with greater temperature differences if you do your exercise in water. And the key point of this is that we're burning additional calories and at rest, those calories predominantly come from fat. That's a great plus if you're actually trying to shed fat pounds. All right, the last bit of this is not really a property of water, but it's a property of being in the prone position when we're actually working out. So as we stated before, if we're standing still, we will get a pulling of blood in the lower extremities. But when we get prone, that blood is now level with the heart, which means it makes it easier for our circulatory system to return that blood to the heart. The more blood we get into the heart, the more blood we can get out, it's all about increasing the intensity of exercise and the duration of exercise in terms of magnifying the health benefits of any activity. All right, so let's go over our take home messages from this introductory portion here. Swimming is a no impact activity. Buoyancy eliminates load from the ankles, the knees, the hips, and really importantly, the spine. Hydrostatic pressure and the prone position, both of these are gonna increase blood return to the heart and increase the efficiency of our exercise. And then of course, the thermal effects of water allow us to rapidly remove heat from the body. All of these increase the exercise intensity and duration. Now this is gonna be a theme that's gonna be repeated over and over again. When we look to see, or when we learn to look to gain health benefits from any activity that we do, what we really need is high intensity, the highest you can do comfortably for the longest period of time. That's why we do interval training. That's why we do HIT. If your only activity is a brief, maybe brisk walk, that's really not enough to see the, the, the great, the, 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 I guess the, the true benefits of exercise. So from there, let's now hop into talking about why swimming is so great in terms of these uh, three benefits that we're gonna talk about next. So we'll start off with cardiovascular health. All right, so the cardiovascular disease is the leading cause of death in the United States as per the CDC. We have one person dies every 34 seconds in the United States from cardiovascular disease. It's pretty morbid. 697,000 people in the U.S. died from heart disease in 2020. That makes one every five deaths, so 20%. Very high. And aerobic exercise should be part of any preventative treatment plan in terms of preventing cardiovascular disease and most, uh, I guess, rehabilitative treatments after you've already had a heart attack. So the first, or the first study I'm gonna show you was done in 40,547 men over a longitudinal span of 37 years, or 32 years, I'm sorry. The individuals ranged from 20 to 90 in terms of their ages. And they looked at all cause mortality. So any deaths that occurred during that time, they would rack it up into their uh, statistical analyses. But the vast majority of deaths that occurred in this cohort of 40,000 men were cardiovascular deaths. So when the researchers controlled for the age of the individual, their body mass index, which is an estimation of body composition, smoking and alcohol, and are also family history of cardiovascular diseases, they got the following results. So looking at a control group that did no activity on a regular basis, they saw about 70,000, or sorry, 70 deaths per 10,000 man years is how they, they uh, did their calculations on this. When they look at the group that did regular walking, they saw that there was a small decrement in the number of the deaths. Running came down more, but then look at how much more uh, swimming actually improved the longevity of these individuals. 
less than half the number of deaths in any of the other group when you swam versus did nothing, walking, or running. Now, the researchers decided, well, the, the answer that they gave for why this actually happened was that swimming allowed for these longer, harder workouts. You're working with individuals who, in many instances, are frail and elderly or ill. Doing high-intensity activities on land is very difficult. So here we have the dog that does not want to walk, and then we have this obese dog that's running, and then we have dogs that are swimming. Okay, so swimming is going to lead to less stressful activity. Okay, you'll have less pulling of blood in the lower extremities. We'll have less heat stress, and we get more blood back to our working muscles, which will improve the intensity and duration of the workout. You're probably getting tired of hearing me say that phrase. All right, so we're going to move on to swimming for respiratory health next. Now, this is the only picture of lungs I could find related to swimming. It's a strange picture. I apologize. Lung disease is a leading ailment in the U.S. as per the American Lung Association. Nearly 37 million Americans live with chronic lung diseases, including asthma, emphysema, and chronic bronchitis. More than 25 million Americans, including over 6 million children, suffer from asthma. So just like we saw with cardiovascular disease, we want aerobic exercise to be part of any treatment plan. But in many instances, land-based activities are very difficult for those with pulmonary disorders. So before we get into the results of the studies that I'm going to present, I want to show you exactly what we're talking about when we talk about pulmonary function. If you've ever had a pulmonary function test, you'll know what I'm talking about. But this is how we test how well the respiratory muscles are at moving air in and out of the lungs. Someone will take what's called a pulmonary function test. Now, in this case, the subject is breathing into what's called a spirometer, which is a device that measures the total volume of air that you can get in and out of the lungs and then how fast it can come out. So she'll start this test by having her nose clipped off. So she's only breathing in and out through her mouth. And she'll take some normal breaths. And that's called your tidal volume. So when you're sitting there resting now, listening to me, you're moving a certain amount of air in and out of your lungs. That's your tidal volume. But then the guy who's administering the test, he'll say, okay, now I want you to take as big a deep breath in as you can possibly take in as fast as you can. And at the peak of that breath, I want you to blast it all out. So that is your functional vital capacity. That is how much air you can physically move in and out of your lungs as fast as possible. So from this test, you'll get two readings. You'll get one, which is the total volume you can move, which is important, okay? That tells you a lot about the actual health of the, the muscles that move air in and out. But just as importantly is how fast can you do it? Okay, if you can breathe in and out quickly, then you have unobstructed airways, which is great. If you have a difficult time breathing in, then you typically have inflammation or clogging of those airways, asthma. If you have a difficult time breathing out, then you may have something called COPD or chronic obstructive pulmonary disorder, emphysema, where you have a difficult time evacuating air from your lungs. All right, so now that we understand what we're measuring, let's take a look at two studies. The first one was in children. So this study looked at 75 children between the ages of seven, eight, who were split up into three groups equally. One was a control that did no activity. The second one did indoor soccer, and the third one did swimming. The last two activity groups, they did their activities twice a week for four months. They measured inspiratory and expiratory pressure. So how much pressure can the respiratory muscles generate when they're moving air? So this is akin to a one rep max for your respiratory muscles. All right, and so what we see here is that the indoor soccer group after four months looked no different than it did before, and it looked no different from the control group. But look at the swimming group. These kids made major uh, improvements in their inspiratory and expiratory pressures over a very short period of time. Now, I'll briefly discuss what the reason is for this and the difference between these. If we think about soccer, that activity is entirely legs. So it's not really working any part of the upper body. Whereas swimming is almost entirely upper body. And you might have a little bit of kick that's only gonna add about 20% in terms of your propulsive force. So it's really a difference between upper versus lower bodies. Now, this isn't children who are growing, obviously. We would expect that there to be an increase in their lung capacities over time, just as they get bigger. What about if we take adults and look at them once they're fully grown? So in this case, this study looked at men between the ages of 20 and 45, and this was a cross-sectional study. They had four groups, non-swimmers, people who had been swimming for less than two years, between two and five years, and for more than five years. And what they measured here was that max volume of air that you can move in and out in a single breath. What they saw was that after two years of swimming, there's not much difference there in terms of how much air you can actually move in and out. 
but we start to see significant improvements between two and five years. And by five years, it's a huge improvement. All right, so what's the take home message from this? Well, let's look at the big headlines. Swimming produces similar results in young and old. That's what we want to see from an activity. If it's something that's only gonna be uh, applicable to one age group, then it's not very useful generally for the entire population. But in this case, we're seeing that it is actually quite useful for everybody. So in red, it's never too late to start swimming. No matter how old you are, you're gonna derive health benefits from hopping into a water or into a tank and doing some swimming. So how does swimming improve our respiratory function? Well, we're gonna get passive strengthening of our respiratory muscles from the hydrostatic pressure. So let's think about this. If we're standing in water and we're breathing, we have a force that's pushing in on our ribs and we have to push it back out. So it's like our respiratory muscles are actually doing weightlifting. And that makes them a great deal stronger in terms, especially in terms of inhaling air. Now, here's another really key point that's different between swimming and every other type of sport is that we hold our breath when we swim. Even if you're a great swimmer and you've got your breathing patterns down tight, when your face is in the water, you're holding your breath, which makes you slightly hypoxic, which means you're increasing the amount of carbon dioxide and lactic acid in the blood. And these two chemicals in your blood have shown to be very, very potent stimulators of physical adaptations to respiratory health. Particularly, they drive the brain to tell those muscles to contract harder to move air in and out. And then the last point is that, as we stated before, swimming is an upper uh, half of your body sport. So we use big muscles like the latissimus dorsi back here to pull down and the pectoral muscles and your abdominal muscles. All of these are active while you're actually swimming. So they get stronger for swimming purposes but they all have a secondary benefit in them as much as these muscles are also responsible for helping us breathe while we're exercising. So these muscles are effectively pulling double duty, okay? And that is something you don't see in land-based exercises because almost all of those are leg-driven. All right, so we're gonna move on to our last bit here and we're gonna talk about swimming and mental health. Anxiety is, oh, I've got this blocking me here. The most commonly diagnosed mental health disorder in the United States, about 19% of Americans suffer from some form of anxiety. Anxiety is associated with an overactive symp sympathetic nervous system and also reduced parasympathetic nervous system activity. And the goal of any treatment is to reverse this imbalance. So what am I talking about when we talk about these two portions of our autonomic nervous system? Well, let's take a look at this. The autonomic nervous system is the part of our brain that we don't control its activities. So we have the somatic nervous system, which controls my muscle movements and my talk and my thought, but autonomic happens immediately without us having to think about it. And we subdivide that into two portions. The first one is the sympathetic nervous system, which runs our fight or flight responses. So in this case, the caveman is running away from the saber-toothed tiger. And then once he's gotten away from this uh, threat, hopefully the parasympathetic nervous system will kick in and say, okay, let's bring everything back down to homeostasis. We need you to rest and digest. So exercise is a fight or flight response. Now remember, exercise in its modern form is only 150, 200 years old. Nobody prior to that went for a run. It was unheard of because you were working in a field all day or you were a blacksmith or whatever the case may be. That was exercise. So let's take a look at what kind of activities we would get from each of these portions of our autonomic nervous system. If we have a sympathetic fight or flight response, our pupils are gonna dilate so we can take in more information from our external environment to see if there's a threat coming. We're gonna get an increase in our heart rate and then also the force with which our heart contracts. We're gonna clear our respiratory ways by bronchodilation so we can get more air in and out. And then we're gonna reduce blood flow to our stomach and our kidneys, because at that moment in time, we really don't care about digesting our last meal, we gotta get away. Once we've gotten away, then we're gonna do the opposite. Our, our, the parasympathetic nervous system is gonna constrict our pupils, slow down our heart rate, constrict our airways, and then we're gonna go back to providing blood flow to our digestive system so that we can assimilate the foods that we just ate. In an individual who has anxiety, the sympathetic nervous system is talking way too much. Okay, and the objective is to actually get it to quiet down. Now, this is not swimming per se, but it is an aquatic activity. So let's look at the next slide here. This is what's called sensory deprivation. Now I've done this and I love it. You go into a tank, 
The ones that I've been in, it's like you have a pod where they pull the lid down on top of you, but in, in a population of anxious individuals, I'm sure they probably did not want to do that part. In this case, it's an open tank and it's filled with brine, salty water, which allows you to float more than you would in just um, non-salty water, in fresh water. So in this case, in this study, they took 50 or 80 individuals, 50 subjects with anxiety, and 30 non-anxious controls, and they allowed them to float in one of these sensory deprivation tanks for one hour. They took measures of um, the negative uh, aspects of uh, anxiety, and then what you would consider, I guess, a parasympathetic response on the other end, the positive or in blue. And there's more than just these, but for example, they took measures, and these were um, questionnaires on pain, fatigue, sleep, the feelings of serenity, energy, and happiness. Now, the results are amazing. You just don't see results like this in biological studies in humans. These changes are dramatic, so much so that the group that was suffering from anxiety looked almost exactly like their non-anxious peers in the control group after the one hour. Okay, so fatigue was decreased, sleepiness decreased, depression went down. They felt a great deal more refreshed afterwards. They felt serene. They had energy and happiness, just the things that we would be looking for. So the quick question here is, how does this work? Well, hydrostatic pressure is going to play a big role here. Okay, so as we squeeze on the body, we shift blood back into the heart. And if we have more blood coming back into the heart, we're going to reduce heart rate. Okay, so we're giving the, the, the nervous system a signal that's just basic that says, it's okay to calm down now. Okay, so SNS activity goes down and PNS activity goes up. And this lasts for hours after you come out of the pool or come out of a sensory deprivation tank. So what I think is happening here is that water is giving us a big warm hug. And now I'm gonna go into this little story about when I was writing this paper, book. I was about halfway through writing this section and I happened across a movie about a person I'd never heard of before. Her name is Temple Grandine, and the movie is eponymously titled Temple Grandine, and the character was played by Claire Danes. Now, Temple Grandine is an engineer who works in the livestock industry, and she's designed a number of ways of corralling and, unfortunately, slaughtering animals that are more humane than what was happening before. She also happens to be autistic. Now, in her story, she described one day when she was at her aunt's house and she was watching them take the calves and vaccinate them. And they would put them into a chute, which had a V like this that would clamp around them and hold them still while they got a shot. She noticed that when they went in, they were agitated, which makes sense. They're separated from their mom and they're gonna be stuck with this big, horrible needle. But as soon as that clamped around them, they calmed down. Now she knew for herself that she very much wanted to be hugged, but she couldn't stand the touch of other humans. So she de devised, this device called a hug box. And she made this in her college dorm room. And same basic premise here, two planks of wood in a V shape that had mattresses on either side that she would lay in and she would pull on that rope that was attached to a set of pulleys that would clamp on her in a sustained control press that felt like having a hug. It would calm down her nerves. Part of this is also just like hydrostatic pressure. It, it actually reduces sympathetic nervous activity. All right, so take home messages from this presentation. Swimming is a dynamic form of exercise that improves health and well being. It improves cardiovascular and respiratory function, improves mood. And I didn't touch on this, but it's in the book. It improves cognitive function as well. In other words, it makes it so that we can learn better immediately after swimming. There is even evidence that just having a public pool in your neighborhood improves the mental health and well being of the surrounding community. So it's a fascinating topic. And look at all these other things that are covered in the book that we didn't even touch. So I highly recommend you reach out and grab this one, 20 bucks on Amazon or wherever you buy books, available on October 25th. Okay, that's pretty sad. No more plugging the book. I'm gonna open it up to questions now. Awesome, okay, so we don't have a lot of time, but I am gonna give you two if you can answer really quick. You bet. Dr. Hutchison, let's see. So the first one was, is it true you should wait after eating? No, that is not true. <laughs> okay. So the old wives tale was that, you know, so if you wait, if you eat, you're going to have a shunting of blood to your gut that's going to go away from your, your muscles. When you get into the water, they're going to cramp. But the research just it does not happen. Now, if you're going to feel a little queasy, I wouldn't go in the water and do a hard workout. But if you just got done eating a hot dog and you're at a barbecue, you can hop in the tank and you'll be just fine. Okay, awesome. Next question. 
Should I swim formal laps or just splash around or a kickboard or what to get a benefit? That's going to be entirely up to each individual person. Uh, what I would say is that if you're interested in you know, really getting into shape, you need to have a tailored workout that's going to be a little bit more than just splashing around. You want it to be as directed and focused as you would for any other type of workout. Now, if you just want to get in and, and experience being in the water, then just do what it is that you feel most comfortable doing. Awesome. Okay. So we're at the end of our time. However, that was an amazing presentation. Oh my God. I love swimming. I'm going to swim even more. I'm going to go swim when we're done here. Okay. Where can people reach you? How can they get a hold of you? Okay. So it is Latin Scotsman at gmail.com. Latin Scotsman at gmail.com. And that's with one. <laughs> time uh, chatting with you today regarding the uh, <clears throat> the topic of Alzheimer's. Feel free to uh, ask questions in the chat box or put in comments in the chat box. Uh, I have it open so that uh, this isn't a one time, this isn't a, a one way lecture. Uh, I rather have a discussion uh, with you guys. So in the chat box, <clears throat> you can just put in <clears throat> questions or, or comments uh, with that. By the way, I'm inside my daughter's bedroom. She's not here, so there you go. But uh, <clears throat> real quickly, um, I play a lot of, uh, of roles in the community when it comes to the Alzheimer's space. I'm with an organization called Alzheimer's Orange County and I'm one of their physician speakers. Uh, we take care of over uh, probably over 25,000 uh, patients with Alzheimer's and their family members that go through uh, our organization every every year for uh, the programs and services we have. I when with the organization that does clinical trials with Alzheimer's. And of course, uh, MD Dow is something we've recently launched to uh, bring healthcare onto the metaverse, onto the blockchain and things of that sort. I wanted to chat with you real quick. And, and typically uh, these are like, I don't know, one hour, one hour and a half lectures that uh, I normally give in Alzheimer's, but I wanna give you some highlights on the things that you can do to reduce your risk uh, for Alzheimer's. Out of curiosity, uh, for those who are here, uh, if you uh, ex have ever experienced Alzheimer's before, whether it's in uh, a family member, a friend, uh, or a neighbor, uh, let me know. I'm curious, how many of us have been affected by Alzheimer's? You can just type in yes, I guess, at some point. Uh, when uh, I go out and lecture in the community about this condition, uh, we, there you go. We uh, absolutely see uh, a lot of folks who have, uh, have family members who have experienced this uh, before. In Orange County, and actually around the nation, Alzheimer's is, uh, among older adults, is the number three cause of death right behind uh, heart disease, uh, heart attacks, which is number one. Cancer is number two, and Alzheimer's is number three. And we uh, uh, see that on a regular basis. Uh, I, as a practicing primary care physician uh, close to 20 years, it's, it was a very common diagnosis. Um, now, in order to talk about prevention of Alzheimer's and uh, reducing the risk of Alzheimer's, we first need to learn and know what causes Alzheimer's, right? What are the, the factors that can promote, uh, you know, Alzheimer's in a patient? Does anyone know what causes Alzheimer's? Uh, feel free to type in the chat box. If anyone know what causes Alzheimer's or what's linked to Alzheimer's, any thoughts on that? Is it... Uh, is it generic? Uh, is it genetics? Is it uh, lifestyle? Um, and things of that sort. So Todd says lifestyle, diet. Gracie says plaque. Uh, 
And okay, it's so. Have anyone heard of the Alzheimer's plaque? Type in yes if you have heard of about the Alzheimer's plaque before. Anyone heard of the Alzheimer's plaque? There's a name to that plaque. I'm gonna type out the name for you here, and uh, called amyloid. Uh, specifically, it's called beta amyloid uh, plaque. And, and this is a plaque that builds up in our brains over time. Uh, this is a abnormal uh, protein that should not be in our brain. Uh, with that, we know that uh, in a healthy, normal brain, we each have about uh, 100 billion brain cells, 100 billion brain cells. So that's a lot of brain cells, right? And these brain cells, what they do is they talk to one another all the time. So one brain cell will communicate to the next brain cell and they'll communicate to the next brain cell. So these brain cells are always talking. Uh, every time you have a thought, your brain cells are connecting and talking and chatting. Uh, every time you have a feeling your brain cells are talking and connecting and chatting, right? So every thought, every feeling is a pattern of brain cells that are talking to one another. So every memory that you have is a specific pattern of brain cells uh, talking. So for example, my memory of dinner last night is maybe this group of brain cells over here chatting with one another. And my memory of breakfast this morning could be this group over here of brain cells connecting and talking to one another. So every memory, every feeling, every thought is a pattern of brain cells connecting. Is that making sense to you guys so far? Uh, type in yes in the chat box if that makes sense to you guys. I wanna make sure that I haven't lost anyone uh, with that. Very cool. So. So what happens in Alzheimer's is that these, these abnormal proteins, right? We call them beta amyloid plaque. They form over time. And in the beginning, it may just be a few plaques that form. It, uh, and the symptoms are really mild. Forgetting a name, forgetting a word, right? Walking into a room and why am I here, right? Could anyone relate to what I'm talking about here? Just mild symptoms with that. But what happens is that over time, as the plaque continues to build up, the memory loss progresses and gets worse, where, uh, where you're forgetting to turn off the stove after you turn it on when you're cooking. You're putting the keys in the refrigerator, right? In the wrong location. Uh, sometimes you can have behavioral changes um, where you become more paranoid, more anxious. Um, and and so, so behavioral changes along with the, the memory changes are often the, uh, the hallmark, right, of, uh, of these plaques that build up over time. And by the way, every patient with Alzheimer's have the plaque. The plaque, this amyloid plaque is required for the diagnosis. So if you have Alzheimer's, then you have the Alzheimer's plaque, okay? It's, it has to be there. If you don't have the plaque in your brains, then you don't have Alzheimer's, okay? So, so if you have the Alzheimer's, you have the plaque. If you don't have the plaque, then you don't have Alzheimer's. Does that make sense to you guys so far, the connection? between Alzheimer's and this plaque, this amyloid plaque. Uh, type in yes, if that makes sense to you guys. Oh, with that, I wanna make sure I haven't lost anyone. Very cool. And so, so let me ask you this. Do you know how many years it takes for plaque buildup before, before a patient starts to have memory loss? How many years? <clears throat> Any guesses, guys? Any guesses? How many years would it take before of plaque buildup before somebody realizes they have memory loss? 
Okay. Grace says three, Celeste says five. By the time a patient with Alzheimer's have their very first memory loss, this plaque has been building up for 15 to 20 years. 15 to 20 years of uh, years of plaque build up. I'm gonna type it out for you guys. Build up uh, before the first memory loss. Pretty crazy, right? So what I'm really saying is that is that Alzheimer's starts 15 to 20 years before you start to have symptoms. And, and so it's been, so the question is, how do you even detect plaque, right? How do you, can you go to your doctor and says, can you give me a plaque test, right? An Alzheimer's plaque test. And your doctor's gonna go like, you're crazy, uh, not available, right? So the, the truth is uh, there are two uh, PET scans, uh, FDA approved PET scans that can detect plaque. One detects the, uh, the amyloid plaque and the other one detects what we call the tau tangles, tau neurofibrillary tangles. And these plaques and tangles, we can now see on a brain scan. The, that's the good news. Um, the bad news is that insurance does not cover these tests and they're quite pricey. There are thousands of dollars. Uh, with that. Uh, what we are doing in, in research, and so I'm in the field of clinical trials and research, is, you know, folks, for folks who are participating in our Alzheimer's um, prevention clinical trials, they get the opportunity to, you know, either have brain scans or even blood tests to uh, look for these plaque, look for the presence at, of the plaque for, uh, for no cost, right? For, so our next question is, why is the plaque there? What causes plaque production, right? What causes plaque production? Because if you know what causes plaque production, then we can start talking about prevention, right? Because you can try to live a lifestyle to reduce the risk of plaque production. Uh, do you guys know what's associated or what causes plaque production? Any thoughts on that? Uh, feel free to just type in the chat box. Uh, what are some of the things that may contribute to, to plaque production, right? Uh, with that, um, I'm going to give you, uh, there are over, so the answer is this, there's over 30 different factors that leads to Alzheimer's plaque production, over 30 different factors, not just one. Um, but rather than giving you 30 plus, you know, items to, to write down, I'm going to categorize these 30 plus different factors that lead to plaque production. I'm gonna categorize them into three different categories, okay? A, B, and C. And um, I call them buckets. They're like buckets of, uh, that catches the Alzheimer's plaque, right? To produce plaque uh, with that. Now, <clears throat> bucket number one of plaque production is the circulation bucket. Uh, what do I mean by that? Any condition that causes poor circulation to your heart, to your body, will also cause poor circulation up to your brain and puts you at risk for Alzheimer's. If I took 10 patients, if I took 10 patients with Alzheimer's, eight of those 10 have high blood pressure. Why is that? Because high blood pressure affects the circulation, right? High blood pressure affects circulation. Uh, if I took 10 patients with Alzheimer's, four of those 10 have diabetes. And your first thought is, you know, diabetes is a blood sugar problem, right? What does it have to do with circulation? Well, if you think about it, diabetics, why do diabetics die, right? What, what kills a diabetic patient? Um, most diabetics die from heart attacks and strokes, right? So the end result of diabetes, guys, is circulation. Circulation is the end result of having a diabetes problem uh, with that. 
Okay, so four patients uh, out of 10 uh, with Alzheimer's, four of them have diabetes. The scary thing with that is that we know that in the United States, two out of three Americans are either diabetic or pre-diabetic. Okay, two out of three of us either have diabetes or pre-diabetes, uh, which is scary, uh, considering that if you have diabetes, it doubles your risk for Alzheimer's. Okay, anyone with diabetes have a double risk for Alzheimer's uh, with that. So 10 patients, eight out of 10 have high blood pressure, four out of 10 have diabetes, three out of those 10 have heart disease, and many of our Alzheimer's patients have high cholesterol. Uh, so what's interesting is that uh, any condition that puts you at risk for heart disease will also put you at risk for Alzheimer's. Uh, high blood pressure, diabetes, high cholesterol, a lack of exercise, obesity, right? Heart disease and Alzheimer's guys share the exact same risk factors. Uh, many folks don't know that. Uh, the, the good news is that if you wanna lower your risk for Alzheimer's, you simply lower your risk for heart disease, okay? That's bucket number one. Bucket number two that, uh, that leads to plaque production is the inflammation bucket, the inflammation bucket. So, so the question is, you know, what do you mean by inflammation bucket? What does that mean? Uh, so inflammation, if you... Uh, if you think about inflammation and what causes inflammation, uh, most of the health conditions we have today is linked to inflammation. And inflammation is simply your immune system trying to fight something that should not be there. So for example, you, you caught the flu, right? One of the first symptoms of the flu is a fever. And so a fever is simply inflammation of your body. That's what it is. Your body gets inflamed, it heats up, you get a fever, right? A fever is when your immune system sees the flu virus and attacks it and tries to fight off this flu virus, right? And so in the, in the middle of this battle between the immune system and the flu, the byproduct of this battle is simply inflammation, okay? Inflammation is the byproduct of the immune system trying to fight something. Now, why do I mention inflammation when it comes to Alzheimer's? Because when we do autopsies of patients with Alzheimer's and we see the plaque in their brains, the amyloid plaque, we also see a lot of inflammation that is around the brain and around these plaques. So Alzheimer's is an inflammatory condition, okay? Inflammatory condition, uh, which leads to the creation of the amyloid plaque. So that's bucket number two, the inflammation bucket. Bucket number three, bucket number three is toxins. Toxins. What do I mean by that? Let me give you some examples. If you live in a city with high pollution, you have a higher risk of Alzheimer's than those who live in a city with low air pollution. Toxins, right? That's toxins that we breathe from the air. Um, it, it gets in your body, your immune system sees it, your immune system fights it, it creates inflammation, which increases plaque production. So, but toxins is not only from the air. Toxin can come from what we drink. Toxins can come from the food uh, that we eat. Uh, sugar is toxic, right? Uh, we know that because it leads to both diabetes, leads to Alzheimer's, too much sugar. Uh, too much alcohol is toxic, right? So we have toxin from our foods as well uh, with that. So those are the three buckets that can lead to, uh, to plaque production, to Alzheimer's plaque production. Are you guys following me so far? Type in yes if you're following me uh, with that. I wanna make sure that I haven't lost anyone. Very cool, 
Okay, so you guys are, are keeping on track. Genetics also play a role with um, Alzheimer's uh, plaque production. Uh, there are many genes, there are over 70 genes that are uh, associated with Alzheimer's. The most important one or the most common one that we know is called the APOE4 gene, APOE4 gene. Uh, those who have a copy of the gene have a higher risk of Alzheimer's. You could have one copy from one parent or two copies from two parents uh, that increases your risk for Alzheimer's. But uh, what you should know is that even if you have the gene, it doesn't condemn you to the diagnosis. It's not a guarantee that you will get Alzheimer's because genetics alone is not enough. Right? It's really genetic plus lifestyle, what we eat, what we drink, and things of that sort that increases our risk for, uh, for Alzheimer's. So if you don't have the gene, it doesn't guarantee that you won't get Alzheimer's. Why is that? Because lifestyle plays a role. And so again, lifestyle plays that bigger uh, risk factor for that. Okay, let me go through some lifestyle stuff that you can do to lower your risk of Alzheimer's. Extra pill. Does that sound good, guys? In the, the five minutes we have here, we're going to go through some lifestyle activities that you can do to lower your risk for Alzheimer's. Uh, two years ago, in the midst of the pandemic in 2020, uh, one of the uh, uh, really popular medical journal called The Lancet right, published a report. And in that report, they have identified 12 risk factors that can be modified with lifestyle changes that can lower your risk of Alzheimer's by 40%, by 40%, okay? And if you can lower these 12 different risk factors, you can lower your risk for Alzheimer's by up to 40%. Does that sound good, guys? By the way, if uh, let me put in my email here for you guys. Everything I talked about, is in a little ebook, and I will be glad to send you the ebook. Uh, just shoot me an email. Uh, my first name, dot last name, uh, at alzoc stands for alzheimersorangecounty.org, uh, and I will send you the ebook that has everything in here. So, 12 modifiable risk factor. Number one, high blood pressure, right? We talked about how high blood pressure can increase the risk of Alzheimer's. Uh, so if you can reduce your risk for blood pressure through exercise, through diet, and things of that sort, uh, you will reduce your risk for Alzheimer's by controlling uh, blood pressure. That's number one. Number two, smoking, right? For those who smoke, their risk for Alzheimer's is higher because of that category number three, the toxins category, right? If you are a smoker, uh, you're introducing toxins, which increases your risk. Uh, quit smoking. When you stop smoking, it lowers your risk, right? Modifiable risk factor. Number three, diabetes. Blood sugar, right? We mentioned how blood sugar or high sugar is toxic to the brain. Uh, so if you can control your blood sugar, you can lower your risk for Alzheimer's. And that's through nutrition and through exercise, okay? Number four, being overweight or obesity, right? Lack of physical activity. Uh, there is a strong link between Alzheimer's and the lack of exercise. Uh, those who exercise on a regular basis have a lower risk of Alzheimer's than th those who do not exercise, right? Those who are obese have a bigger risk for Alzheimer's than those who are thinner modifiable risk factor. Number five, poor nutrition. Okay. Uh, and I'll send you an ebook that will list 10 different foods you can eat to lower your risk for, for Alzheimer's. Okay. Next is excessive alcohol use. Excessive alcohol use. If you can lower or stop or reduce alcohol use, you will lower your risk for Alzheimer's as well. Next is low level of brain exercise. We know that those who exercise their brains 
through either crossword puzzles or playing games, Sudoku, chess checkers, uh, have a, those who exercise their brains and engage their brains on a regular basis have a lower risk of Alzheimer's than those who are not engaging their brains, okay? Next, depression. There is a link between depression and Alzheimer's. Uh, so that's not great news, but the good news is if depression can be addressed and treated, then from a mental health perspective, it'll help lower the risk of Alzheimer's, okay? Next after this is traumatic brain injuries. We see a high risk for those who are sports athletes uh, with memory loss, football players, boxers, things of that sort. So if you can find ways to reduce your risk of brain injury, all the better. Uh, number 10 is hearing loss. There's an association between hearing loss and Alzheimer's, probably due to the lack of stimulation to the brain. Uh, so if you have hearing loss, it's fixable with hearing aid. Got it, guys? Number 11 is social isolation. Those who are home alone, socially isolated, have a higher risk of Alzheimer's than those who are out there socially engaged. And finally, guys, number 12, air pollution. Uh, if you, uh, I don't know how much you can deal with that, but if you can live or be in a, an environment with better air, uh, cleaner air, you're lower your risk for Alzheimer's, guys. Those are the 12 things, guys, that will reduce your risk by 40%. Thanks so much. <laughs> awesome. Thank you so much, Dr. Trin. You're always a pleasure to have on and so knowledgeable. I actually, my grandmother had personally had, had passed having Alzheimer's and it was so interesting to, to sit here and learn. I, I wish we knew as much then as we know now. So I think you, most of the questions were how it could help holistically, you know, how a holistic lifestyle could help. So I think you answered those great. Mm -hmm. Um, Thank you so much for your time. You already put where you could be contacted in the chat. Yep. You might just want to verbally say that as well in case people. Sure. The chat. It's just my first name, D-U-N-G dot, my last name, T-R-I-N-H at A-L-Z-O-C, A -L -A -L -Z -O -C dot org. That is my email. Shoot me an email and I'll send you a... Uh, take care, guys. Well, aloha, everyone, and thank you, Celeste. I'm so happy to be here. And yes, it is early. It's 8 a.m. my time. So my fiancé got the kids off to school so that I could be here with you, and I'm happy to get started. So the topic for today is um, basically I just wanted to do a Q&A because I can talk about I can talk until the cows come home about sleep. Sleep is absolutely my passion. I love everything about it. And what I find is oftentimes most helpful is actually just to answer questions. So I don't know, how many people do we have on today? Is it is there a good number or are there just a, a few people who can make it? No, there's actually a good number. It's been up and down through the whole thing. And then, of course, you know, the recording after the fact to get so yes. much more attention as well, because our YouTube channel gets uh, gets a lot of hits as well. So hopefully we can kind of cover everything. If it's OK, I'll start in on my questions and you can kind of build from there? Or yeah, you... I was, so I was going to give a few sleep facts. Just Absolutely. To kind of Let's do that. Websites. And then if anybody, while we're talking or after Celeste, uh, you ask your questions, if anybody else has questions, who's on, you can just pop them in the chat and we'll, we'll get them answered. Awesome. So, um, when you see me looking off to the side, it's cause I have another screen. So that's what's going on. Um, so I'm just going to run through these because I think they're all so fascinating. So one in four married couples sleep in separate beds. That means that only, you know, we have this big mystique about if you love someone, you have to sleep in the same bed as them. And uh, unfortunately, that doesn't always work out. So <clears throat> that's something that I really like to educate people about is the fact that you can absolutely have a wonderfully loving relationship with someone and choose to sleep in separate beds. And humans spend one third of their lives sleeping. So that's a huge chunk of time. And so 
it's really important to have good quality of sleep and also to make sure that your bedroom environment is one that is healthy for you and conducive to both quality and quantity of sleep. And sleep deprivation will kill you more quickly than food deprivation. So uh, this is just a cool little fact. Um, they used to do the Guinness Book of World Records for the person who can sleep the uh, go without sleep the longest, but that's the one out of all these daring things that they do for the Guinness Book of World Records, that's the one that they took out and they don't let people do anymore because they uh, basically discovered that it was something that was more dangerous than all these other daring feats to have someone um, try to go without sleep for an extended period of time. And the average person can sleep, uh, can survive two weeks without water, but only 10 days without sleep. And humans are the only mammals that uh, with that sleep that will willingly delay it, which I think is so important because we have a, um, an epidemic of sleep deprivation on the planet right now. And that is due to a lot of different factors, but we're the only, we're, we're supposed to be the most intelligent species. And yet we're the only species who will stay up and watch TikTok or, you know, do all the things that we do and not prioritize our sleep. So I find that really fascinating as well. And um, I could go on and on, but let's, we can come back to the facts if we want to, but that's just a little bit to get, to get us started. And Celeste, if you have some questions, I'd love to hear them. Awesome. Absolutely. So we've already had one in the chat. I'll just start with that one first. Is a nap helpful or hurtful for a good night's sleep? I see you, Lee. So I love this question. It's a great question. And the answer, and you'll, you'll hear that a lot of my answers are, it depends. And in this instance, a nap can be really, really wonderful. It depends on the length of time that you do it and the time of day. So there's something called sleep pressure, which builds as we, the, the longer we stay awake. So there's two different things that control sleep. One is our circadian rhythm which is uh, basically impacted by many different things, but primarily by the cycles of light and dark in nature. And so the exposure to light is really, really an important factor in our ability to sleep well. But the other thing is sleep pressure. And as I just said, that is something that occurs based on a chemical called adenosine. And when you uh, go without sleep, it builds in the body and then it makes us more sleepy. So if you take a nap, and you take it too late in the day, too close to when you're supposed to be going to sleep, then you won't have the sleep pressure that will allow you to feel drowsy. So it's really independent for the person. And some people are, you know, I talk to people frequently about sleep and some people will say, I cannot nap. It's, you know, it makes me feel worse. And some people say, I absolutely need a nap in the afternoon. What I will say is that we have a natural, um, time where our cortisol levels drop in the day. And that's been traditionally known as siesta time in, in cultures uh, like in Europe. And, um, and so if you can time your nap with that siesta time, which is usually around 2 p.m. in the afternoon, then that's a really great time because the body naturally wants to rest during that time. And even if you don't nap or don't want to nap, if you can honor your body, so, you know, we're here for the Holistic Lifestyle Expo and part of having holistic sleep is really honoring the cycles um, and the, the cycles that occur on a daily basis in your body. And one of them is that you have this natural dip of energy in the afternoon. And in our modern culture, because we have so many demands on us, uh, most people will power through it by eating a piece of chocolate or having another cup of coffee. And that really isn't good for the long term in terms of the health of your nervous system, because your body is actually trying to take a rest during that time period in the early afternoon in the day. And so even if you don't nap, if you can just take a rest, even if it's just 10 minutes, you know, shutting your eyes, breathing something, if you're at work, you know, getting, getting a small break, it would be so good for your nervous system and it'll actually help you sleep better. And what I've noticed is that it seems like what happens during that time 
is that I call it um, like brain defragging. So when I take a rest during that time, what I notice is that all of the um, all of the stuff that I've experienced in the morning, the emotional stuff, the learning that I've done, it just has a chance to kind of simmer down so that my brain and my nervous system doesn't get overwhelmed. And then I'm more capable and more available and more present for what, what is going to happen in the later part of my day. So it actually, just that short little break will give me more space to be um, more functional in, in the later part of the day in the evening. So I hope that answers your question, Lee. If you have a follow-up question, please feel free to ask it. And it says, uh, there's another question. I think this is also from Lee. Working the graveyard, <laughs> good, thank you, Lee. Um, working the graveyard shift changes sleep habits. Can that be harmful long-term or does your body get used to it? This is another great question. Um, I've actually interviewed a, um, a woman, she's uh, called the Night Shift uh, Biohacker. I think she has an Instagram account and she chooses to work uh, the night shift consistently. And she's a, she's a nurse. And so she does all these different things in order to try to biohack her health and optimize her health. And she's doing a really good job. However, most people don't take that much care and attention to working the graveyard shift. And they have associated working um, nights to uh, being a carcinogen. It's that detrimental to your health. So I know that there's people that need to work the graveyard shift. I know that we need workers to do that. Um, I would say that if you have any health issues, if you're working the graveyard shift and you have any health issues at all, then I would really look into a, a job change first and foremost, because it is, and this is a hard truth. And I hate to say it because I know people have to do it. And, and I know people need to make a living, but it is really, really detrimental to your health. And it's something that is likely to diminish your longevity. Given that someone does need to work the graveyard shift, there's things that you can do that can help you. One of them, um, like I discussed earlier, is being able to, as much as possible, control the, the cycles of light and dark. So most people that are working a great graveyard shift are exposed to really, really bright um, fluorescent light at in the middle of the night, which is when we should be in complete darkness. And it really messes up our circadian rhythm and messes up so many different functions in the body. So one thing that you can do if the environment, if the workplace that you're in will allow it is to use um, a lens technology that will regulate the light that's coming into your eyes because we primarily receive um, light through our eyes, although we also have photoreceptors on our skin as well. So wearing a long shirt that covers your skin so that you're not absorbing that, um, that light, the light into your skin wearing a hat if you need to, and then wearing a lens technology can really help with that. Also eating, um, modulating the times of the day that you're eating and not eating. So a lot of shift workers will have like a stash of candy in their, in their drawer to just kind of make it through the night. And that's really not helpful. So there's specific ways that you can hack your nutrition and hack the timing of when you eat in order to better mimic what would be going on if you were sleeping. Another thing um, that is really important is to make sure that when you do get off of your shift, you stay up long enough just to get that first morning light of, of sunlight exposure. And then a lot of um, shift workers who are, who are conscious of this and doing the best that they can will use things like um, infrared light in order to get more of the light frequencies that they're missing during the day. So those are just some of the things that you can do um, in order to, to, um, sleep better. And then obviously when you're sleeping during the day, when you're catching up on that sleep, making, making sure that you are sleeping in a completely dark room, making sure that your home as much as possible has that, um, dark light and that you're not then exposing yourself to more of that blue light. And I do want to say something about this because it's um, a common misnomer. We've heard about blue blocking glasses and the idea that blue light is bad for us. And the truth is that um, we 
so the sun has a whole bunch of different spectrums of light and we need all of them. The problem is that because of uh, the fact that we are on digital devices all the time and because of the type of light that comes out of uh, fluorescent light bulbs, which are the ones that we use most frequently because they're also the most um, economical, those have a really uh, unnatural high amount of the blue spectrum of light. And so the amount of light that we would naturally get from the sun, from sunlight is much more um, balanced. However, the uh, light that we get from screens and the light that we get from light bulbs is imbalanced and is much higher in the uh, blue uh, spectrum. So there's a few companies who have done a really, really good job of making sure that the lenses that they create balance the light, but they don't completely block the blue light because you don't want that. You just want it to naturally mimic the sunlight as much as possible. And so um, just making sure that when you're at home, after you get off of your shift and um, you're trying to wind down that you uh, manipulate your environment to have basically the same kind of light that you ha would have in the evening or in the early morning, which would be more in the red and the orange frequencies of um, the light spectrum and not that blue light because the blue light basically tells our bodies that it's, um, that it's high noon. So when we're on our screens, when you're working that night shift, you're getting mixed signals that's telling your body it's high noon all throughout the night. And then the body doesn't know what to do and it doesn't know when to digest food and, and when, to, um, when to regulate the immune system and do all the things that it needs to do to take care of yourself. That's so interesting. And it, it did also answer another question we had that the question had been, is the TV computer, et cetera, really bad when, you know, as you're going to sleep. So you answered that one as well. That was great. We have one here on the Q and a right now. So um, can I expand on that for just yeah, one second? Absolutely. I was specifically talking about uh, night shift workers, but it's really important for everyone yeah. in term, especially if you're having issues with insomnia. So when we when we evolved over the course of a really really long time the only light exposure that we had was the light from the moon maybe a campfire and then and then sunlight and people lived outside they lived in you know caves or huts or something like that and they woke up when the sun rose and then they were outside in the natural sunlight all day long and then as the sun would set they would start to wind down. They might sit around the campfire for a little while and they would get sleepy and they would go to bed. And so now we have all of these weird spectrums of light and, their, and the exposure to that at all different times of day. So even for someone who's not working uh, a graveyard shift, if you're on your computer all day or you're in, a, in an indoor environment all day, that can really disrupt your circadian rhythm. And so what can you do about it? You can do the same thing. You can wear a lens technology, which I don't know where mine are, but if I wasn't doing a presentation, I would be wearing a lens technology that balances that light spectrum while I'm on my computer. And um, the other thing that you can do is be mindful of the light exposure that you have at night and mimic what's going on in the external environment, out, outdoors and nature, in your home environment. So, so many people aren't aware of this and they'll just leave bright lights on or as they're getting ready for bed in their bathroom, they'll have these bright lights on. Or if they're waking up in the night, they'll flip on the light when they go to the bathroom and then have this bright light. And all of those things are really confusing to the body and disrupt your circadian rhythm. So if you can get amber colored bulbs or red um, bulbs, it's kind of funny because it makes your house look a little bit weird. But in my house, after after dark, we don't use any bright lights. We have red lights all over the house. And it's, it's kind of like really nice mood lighting, but it also really helps with sleep. So it's important for, for everyone, especially in the digital age that we're in, not just graveyard shift workers. That's awesome. My house is going to look like a, like a club at night now. <laughs> yeah, <exactly. laughs> That's awesome. Okay. So another question on Q and a, what is your opinion on having pets in bed? Great question. My answer is it depends, right? For some people, it's very comforting. It's wonderful. It doesn't bother them. For some people, it um, can affect them because they have allergies 
or because the pet is moving. And I will say this, if you're not sleeping well, or if you're waking up in the night and you sleep with your pet, try to not sleep with that pet and see what changes. Some people, I am one of them. I actually just found this out recently because I did a um, functional genetic test with a company called the DNA company. They're, they're pretty new, but they have a fantastic test. And what I learned from them is that they're, they, they tested actually about 4,000 people um, specifically looking at their sleep and their sleep patterns. And what they discovered is that over 3,000 out of the 4,000 people that they tested have this issue where they have a gene that causes them to have, this is kind of technical, but it causes them to have um, disrupted serotonin production throughout the night, which makes them much more um, sensitive to any sound or any disturbance in their environment. And so for those people, which is actually the majority of people, um, you need to be very careful of your sleep environment in terms of temperature disruption, noise disruption, movement, because all of those things will unfortunately impact your sleep. And so if there's a, a cat or a dog that, you know, is just shifting in bed or even a partner for that, for the, for that um, matter, all of these things can, can disrupt sleep. So it's something to experiment with and to figure out whether, you know, it's, it's an issue for you. Got it. Okay. So this one came through on our Instagram post. Um, there are a lot of sleep apps and different devices now are things like the aura ring good to use, or is it just a play basically is what they're asking, I guess. Yeah. So again, <laughs> I Again, record, but it, <laughs> it depends. depends. <laughs> yeah. So, um, I don't in general like to we wearable trackers. And the reason for that is because for several reasons, first of all, some people are really sensitive. And I know that the aura ring says there's no emissions that are coming off of it, no electromagnetic frequency emissions, but still some people are just sensitive to those kinds of things. Another thing is that it can work backwards. It can be kind of like reverse psychology where all of a sudden now you're worrying about your sleep more and you're, you know, oh, I didn't get a good sleep score last night. And, oh, I did it. So it depends on the kind of person you are. It depends on the reason that you're using something like that. I think that getting a baseline, it can be a good thing, but here's the thing. You don't need a sleep tracker to know whether you got a good night's sleep. You will either wake up and you will be bright and refreshed and you'll have sustained uh, natural energy where you don't have to be caffeinating um, to get through your day, or you're going to feel crappy and you're not going to be able to re have memory recall and you're going to drag throughout the day and get sleepy. And, and then you'll know. The, the caveat to this is for people who are wondering if they might have obstructive sleep apnea. And obstructive sleep apnea is something that you really, really need to have addressed medically because it is another one of those things that like graveyard shift working is a carcinogen. And there's a difference between snoring and having obstructive sleep apnea. And some people who have obstructive sleep apnea don't really snore. So you can't use that as a litmus, but what you can use as a litmus is um, there's actually a, a, a test that you can take and see how you score on it. But am I waking up sleepy? Am I feeling drowsy? If I sit in a chair for um, 10 minutes, would I be likely to drift off to sleep? Do I ever feel like when I'm driving that I'm nodding off? Things like that um, will indicate, am I overweight? Um, do I have other health issues? Things like this will let you know that obstructive sleep apnea could be something that's going on with you. And then a, uh, a tracker or better off, they now have home um, polysomnogram tests that you can take. And this can help you determine whether you have um, OSA. And again, the sleep trackers, they're fun. You know, it's, 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 I think we just have to be mindful of why we're using it. And the impact that it's having on us and whether it's actually 
helping us or just making us more anxious or giving us more mind chatter, you know, that's that's preventing us from sleeping well. Absolutely. Okay. What are your thoughts on sleep supplements such as melatonin? Yes. So melatonin is, you know, like the, the rock star, the supermodel of sleep. And it's really interesting because melatonin only works if you are having difficulty uh, falling asleep because you have a disrupted circadian rhythm cycle. So we need melatonin. Melatonin is the um, hormone that tells our bodies that it's time to fall asleep. So melatonin is really good if you have a, um, if you're working the graveyard shift or if you are traveling between time zones and your body is confused about what time it is. Or for some people, um, as they age, they don't produce as much melatonin. So they might need to supplement with melatonin. And it's interesting too, because melatonin has been shown to be um, uh, effective uh, against cancer. So it has its benefits, but for people who have chronic severe insomnia and they're waking up in the middle of the night, it's unlikely that it's going to be melatonin that's going to solve that because it's unlikely that it's a melatonin deficiency that is, that is causing that in the first place. So I would say, um, there's, there's many different supplements to take. Some of them are really effective for sleep and some of them are not. And it really depends on what's going on with the individual. And I have also a very, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, uh, not, not commonly agreed upon opinion also about, uh, sleep medications. So there's this opinion that sleep meds are bad and that they should never be used. And it, and I work holistically with people. And so for me, I know that there's this very narrow definition of what it means to be holistic and holistic is basically equated with completely natural, you know, not using anything with chemicals or that kind of a thing. And for me, the definition of holistic is actually slightly different, which means you look at the individual and what the individual needs and how that individual body functions and and how best for that individual to get from point A to point B. And so for some people, for uh, because chronic insomnia can be so, um, so anxiety creating for, for some people, using a sleep medication for a short period of time just to get them over that hump of, oh my gosh, I can't fall asleep no matter what. I'm never going to be able to fall asleep. It's never going to happen for me can be a really effective tool. There's other things like cognitive behavioral therapy for insomnia, which are also very effective for some people. But I just, I I get frustrated when people just automatically assume that using a sleep med is never okay. And they kind of um, make people feel ashamed for even suggesting that that might be something that they want to try. Interesting. Very true. Okay. This next question is very, it's very simple and to the point, but I think it's probably if you would ask a lot of the people out there, you know, give me a, something you want to know about sleep, this would be it. And this, it's funny because I really do think that the answer to this one is it depends, <laughs> but the question is, is how much sleep do you need? Yeah, actually this is kind of a not, and it depends. I, I, <laughs> awesome. <yeah>. Okay. <laughs> so, you know, I'm sure, you know, someone who says, or there are a lot of people in the media, famous people in the media who will say, I do great on six hours of sleep, or, you know, I only take micro naps throughout the day and I'm rocking it. And the reality is that the vast majority of people need between seven and a half and nine hours of sleep per night. And the people who need less than that, or the people will just go with less. The people who need less than that is like 0.0001% of the population. And it's because they have a genetic anomaly. So if you're, and, and you can test for that, you can actually test to see if you have that gene. But 
most people know, oh yeah, if I get less than, you know, seven hours of sleep, I'm a wreck or, you know, I need, I need at least eight hours of sleep. And here's why there's the um, discrepancy between the 7.5 and the nine hours of sleep. You have to understand how a normal sleep cycle works in order to understand what that's about. So we sleep for approximately 90 minutes per night, but for some people that sleep cycle, and then we go through that same uh, approximate 90 minute cycle several times in the night. However, for some people, it might be 78 minutes. And for some people, it might be 95 minutes. And when you multiply that by the number of sleep cycles that we have in a night, and you get that total number, that's how some people only need the seven and a half and some people need the, need the nine. Um, but yeah, if you're, uh, if you're like the vast, vast majority of people, you really do need um, approximately eight hours of sleep per night. Awesome. Okay. Got it. And next question, I'm going to try to get through these so we can get through them all. We've got three more. Um, let's see here. This one was just from social. Okay. Um, my boyfriend has full body twitches, almost like his whole body tenses, then releases. It's very rhythmic. Like every 10 seconds seems to happen when he's trying to fall asleep. What is this? Yeah. So those are um, very, very common for, for everyone. And we all have them to a degree. Babies have them too. And um, it's, it's as we're dropping into the deeper stages of sleep, it's completely normal. Um, if it happens all throughout the night, then that's something that you might want to have looked into because he could have a, um, an issue with his sleep that is more than just the normal thing. But if he's sleeping um, well, then, then it's fine. Here's where that question comes into play is, does this person who is sleeping in the same bed as him have issues because he's keeping her awake? Because if it's happening just when they're both falling asleep, that could be fine. Um, or it could be something that's actually really disrupting her because he's twitching and she's simultaneously trying to fall asleep at the same time. And because she's one of those people who's genetically sensitive to movement, it's actually causing her to, um, to have difficulty falling asleep. And for some people, if they get uh, woken up while they're falling asleep, then they, they let go of that sleep pressure, but it also kind of creates a fight or flight response in their body. And then they can't fall back asleep for a while. So I would say for you, it could be completely normal or it's possible that it's um, that you actually have an issue with your sleep that you need to get, or he has an issue with his sleep that he needs to get looked at. And there might need to be some navigating in terms of how you guys uh, sleep together, because you might need to, you know, crawl into bed 20 minutes later than him, just so that as he's falling in and as he's twitching, it doesn't disrupt your ability to fall asleep. Great. Okay. Next question. Is CBD good to take to help fall asleep? Yeah, again, this is, this is an, it depends question. So CBD is amazing for so many different things for anyone who doesn't know very much about it. They recently discovered that we have an entire system in our body that's similar, you know, not similar to, but just like the lymphatic system and the circulatory system, we have the endocannabinoid system, which is specifically, um, utilizes uh, CBD and we have all these receptors in our body that does so many different things. So for, let me back up a little bit. Uh, centuries ago, before we had this prohibition on hemp and on marijuana, uh, there was a lot of um, hemp and marijuana growing just naturally everywhere because it grows like a weed. That's part of the reason that the word weed is associated with this plant. And so we all humans um, would naturally have more of this just in our system because we would get it from the pollen in the air. We would get it from the animals that we would eat because the animals would graze on it. So in, in comparison to our bodies uh, several hundred years ago, we have somewhat of a deficiency in these um, in these 
CBD chemicals in our body. And so a lot of people find that supplementing with CBD is very helpful to them. Um, for sleep specifically, some people will try it and they'll say, oh my gosh, it was amazing. I couldn't sleep. I took it. Now I can sleep great. So what I hear more frequently is I took it, it worked for a while, but now it's not working anymore. Why? And um, there's a company that I have interviewed the founder of and um, it's, it's a, it's a wonderful interview and he's uh, very well versed. That could be because you're not taking the proper dose um, and your body has gotten kind of used to that dose. It could also be because you have a different underlying um, sleep issue and the CBD was kind of like a bandaid, but it didn't really address the underlying root cause of what's going on with you. So I don't think that there's any harm for anyone in trying CBD. And when you try, you definitely want to start with a very low and slow dose and titrate up from there. There's an organization called Realm of Caring, and you can check them out. It's, I think, just realmofcaring.org. And they actually offer free consultations to anyone. So if, especially if you have any health issues um, that you are, that, are, you know, that you're predisposed to, I recommend that you contact Realm of Caring, get a consultation with them, tell them specifically what's going on with your, with your health. And then they will advise you about the best way to supplement with CBD and see if it's effective for you. One other thing that I will say about CBD is that there's lots of different types of CBD out there and you can get it from all over the place. And CBD is a plant that um, actually helps to kind of leach the chemicals out of the soil. And so you want to make sure that you're getting a completely organic CBD because you don't want to get something that has um, funky chemicals in it and ingest those when you're trying to do something to improve your health. The other thing that I will say is that there are um, lots of different CBD isolates and those are very much more chemi chemically um, oriented. Like if you see them, they actually look like a little white powder instead of you know, the green plant that it, that it is. And so you really want to get a CBD that is full spectrum um, because there is something called the entourage effect, which is basically the idea that all the different constituents and polyphenols and the different parts of the plant work in harmony and in synergy together to, uh, to do the magical, wonderful things that it does in the body. And um, when you take an isolate, it doesn't have that broad spectrum effect. So definitely look for something that is full spectrum as well. Great. Okay. Last question. Pillows or no pillows? Yay. <laughs> <laughs> Very personal, uh, personal uh, choice here. Um, I worked with a physical therapist here on uh, my little island and he has goodness. I think he has eight children. And he would tell me, cause I have a whiplash injury. So I was seeing him to get help for my cervical spine. And he told me a story about how all of his children, after they would go to bed, at, and they're all grown now, but when they were little, he would take their pillows. And after they, fall, they fell asleep, he would yank them all out so that they weren't sleeping with a pillow. So there's different reasons that you want to use a pillow and there's different um, things to be aware of. For someone who's dealing with obstructive sleep apnea, it may be absolutely necessary that they keep their head elevated and sleep at an incline because one of the things that causes obstructive sleep apnea is that your uh, a person's jaw can actually kind of slide back in their throat and then obstruct their, their airway. So people that have this going on find that when they sleep elevated, it, their jaw slides back less and then they have, um, they can, they can breathe better. Uh, so that's important for anyone with OSA. For other people, um, if, if you can sleep, if you, so it, it's sleeping position too. So this is kind of um, just an aside, but they've, there have been studies that have been done that show that if you sleep on your side, 
your glymphatic system, which is the system in your brain that, that detoxifies your brain at night while you sleep can work more effectively. So for most people sleeping on your side is likely to be the healthiest way to sleep. That said, whatever position you sleep in that you sleep well in, do that. So if you're going to sleep on your side, getting one of those pillows that has the curve in it that supports your, um, your neck so that your cervical spine so that you aren't, you know, crunching your neck is really important. Um, and if you're a back sleeper, then obviously sleeping without a pillow is probably best because your spine will lay flat and it will be more healthy. Um, so it kind of depends. And, and I would say, and this is true for mattresses and pillows. I mentioned earlier, we spend a third of our lives in bed. So you really want to make sure that your mattress and your pillow are non-toxic because most of the mattresses and most of the pillows are treated, especially in the United States, with a whole ton of chemicals and flame retardants. And that's when we sleep, uh, our bodies actually go into a parasympathetic nervous system state. And that means that our immune system guard is down during that time while we sleep. So we're very, very vulnerable. Our immune system, our body is very vulnerable when we're in a, um, a sleep state. And so that's the worst time of day to be exposed to chemicals. So really looking at your bedroom environment and getting as many toxins, especially out of the mattress and out of the pillow that you can, um, will be, you know, is, is the best thing that you can do for your health. Awesome. Okay. Susie, tell us where we can find you. So I have a website. It's just my name. So it's Suzy, S-U-Z-I-E, S-E-N-K.com. And uh, you can go there and you can sign up for my mailing list and you can get free gifts. And that's the best way to stay in touch with me and find out what's going on. Um, I regularly do events and, um, and have wonderful fun stuff. And like I said, I'm a, uh, I can, I can talk forever about sleep. So I, um, I oftentimes will share different information through that newsletter. And um, my practice is not just sleep, it's holistic wellness as well. And I um, work through a functional medicine perspective. So I don't just cover sleep, I cover everything related to sleep because truly there is nothing related to health that's not related to sleep because sleep is the foundation of health. So you can find out more by going to my website.